guess what time it is. It's time to register for CrimeCon 2019. CrimeCon is the largest gathering of true crime fans in the world. You will meet up close and personal true crime journalists, authors, investigators, podcasters, and media personalities. CrimeCon is equal parts education and experience with plenty of time for meet and greets and the ability to ask those burning questions you have about true crime cases you've long been fascinated by. CrimeCon 2019 will be held June 7th through 9th at the Hilton Riverside in New Orleans. New guests just announced include Deborah and Tara Newell, whose story was featured on the very popular podcast Dirty John that was also made into a miniseries. Rabia Chowdhury will also be there to talk about the continued fight to exonerate Adnan Syed. And new additions to Podcast Row include Nick and the Captain from True Crime Garage. And of course, I will also be on Podcast Row and I can't wait to meet you. Use my discount code ONCE19 to get 10% off a standard badge registration at crimecon.com. And if you use the discount code ONCE19, send a screenshot of your registration just showing your name and the redeemed discount code once 19, and you'll be entered into a drawing for a VIP guest pass for our New Orleans meetup during CrimeCon week. You can only be entered into that drawing if you use my discount code once 19. Meetup details will be released at a later date, but I promise it will be a blast. Don't wait. CrimeCon is expected to sell out this year and you don't want to miss it. Once again, CrimeCon will be held June 7th through 9th in New Orleans. Register at crimecon.com and get 10% off a standard badge when you use discount code ONCE19. And I'll see you there. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. It's springtime, and we all know what that means. This is the time of the year when all our fancies turn to thoughts of sports. Whether we're headed out to the ball game or shuffling the kids in between softball games and soccer practice, in the first mild days of spring, many spend enjoyable afternoons playing or watching sports. But every once in a while, these wholesome and family-friendly activities can devolve into not-so-pleasant incidents. In this month's series, Bad Sports, I'll share stories about bad things happening at sporting events or by sports figures. In this first episode, a neighborhood ice hockey rink, a peewee hockey pickup game, and some unsportsmanlike conduct leads to a confrontation between parents that ends with tragic results. This is the case of Thomas Junta, Hockey Dad. It was a warm day in Reading, Massachusetts, when Thomas Junta, age 44, ended his workday driving his delivery truck. It was late afternoon, around 2 p.m., when Junta got a call from his wife Michelle, a part-time swimming instructor. Thomas and Michelle had been married for 14 years and had two children. Their son Quinlan was 10 years old, and their daughter Kendall, 17. Michelle asked her husband to swing by the Burbank Ice Arena to pick up their son and his two friends, Travis and Garrett. The boys had been dropped off at the public ice arena earlier that afternoon to practice their hockey skills. Stick practice, as it was called, was informal and open to everyone. Kids would come to skate and join in pickup games with others who were also there to get in some practice. Michelle told Thomas that when the skating session was over, the boys wanted to go swimming. He agreed to pick them up and bring them to the swimming pool when hockey practice ended. Thomas Junta was a big, friendly guy. Most described him as a gentle giant, standing at six feet tall and weighing 275 pounds. He and his wife had problems earlier in their marriage, and they had separated for a year, but they'd worked things out and stayed together. Junta was a good dad by all accounts and enjoyed spending time with his kids at their sports events. Both of his children played ice hockey, as the sport was popular in New England. Quinlan played in the Community Youth League, and his sister was co-captain of her high school team. So Thomas Junta was familiar with the setup at the hockey rink during stick practice. The pickup games weren't supervised, and the participants were expected to follow the rules and play a fair game. The players varied in ages, 
so it was incumbent on them to not get too rough since some of the kids, such as Quinlan, were grade school aged, while others might be in their teens. The older kids could easily overpower the younger kids in such a highly physical sport. Junta entered the rink and took a seat in the bleachers as he watched the end of a pickup game his son and his friends were playing. Also participating in the game were three brothers, Brendan, 14, Michael, 13, and Sean, 12. The father of the three boys, Michael Costin, age 40, was also on the ice and acting as the referee. Costin was a single father of four from Linfield, who worked as a carpenter. As Junta watched the game, he noticed that the older boys were playing rough. In stick practice games, there's supposed to be no hitting or slashing, a move where a player swings their hockey stick at an opposing player. In a real game, a penalty would be called for doing so. Fights breaking out on the ice during games is a common occurrence and something that hockey fans enjoy seeing as part of the game. But again, this was not allowed during stick practice at the Burbank Ice Arena. Junta first watched as his son got elbowed in the face by one of the older boys. The bigger boys were not playing by the rules, Junta would later report. They were tripping and cross-checking, or using the shaft of the stick between two hands to forcefully check an opponent, an infraction of the rules of the game. Junta thought they were taking cheap shots as well, and all this time the ref wasn't calling penalties on any of the players or even addressing the rough play. Finally, a fight broke out on the ice, and Quinlan would later report that his friend Travis was pushed down by one of the Costin boys. Now Junta became angry. He ran down through the ice to break up another fight, where one boy was swinging his stick at another. None of that cheap shot bullshit, he yelled at the boys. This is supposed to be fun hockey. He then turned to the referee, Michael Costin, and yelled at him to stop all the rough play. Costin reportedly dismissed Junta, saying, Hockey is about hitting. Junta replied, That's bullshit. It's about having fun. Costin then responded, It's hockey. That's the way it's supposed to be played, as he walked away from Junta. The buzzer sounded soon afterward, ending the session at 4 p.m. Quinlan left the ice to go to the locker room and change out of his gear. He was holding his injured neck and face and crying. Junta followed his son, saying, Defend yourself. Don't take those cheap shots. Quinlan and his friends entered one locker room, and the bigger boys entered a second. Junta, still angry, encountered Michael Costin in the hallway between the two locker rooms. Junta yelled at Costin, then both men began hurling expletives back and forth. Within seconds, the fight turned physical, and the two men began grabbing and punching each other. Costin, who also stood about six feet tall, but weighed 100 pounds less than Junta, was backed against the wall. He grabbed at the bigger man, tearing his shirt and breaking his gold chain that hung around his neck. Junta lunged at him, and Costin fell to the ground, landing on his back. He continued to throw punches and kick at the bigger man with the ice skates he was still wearing. There were several witnesses to the brawl, including several children. An 18-year-old named Ryan Carr and several other men broke up the fight quickly. The men followed their children into separate locker rooms and Junta soon left the rink through the lobby. He would later say he went out to the parking lot to wait for the boys to finish changing and meet him at the car, but then thought better of it. He said he worried about Quinlan being inside with the older boys, so he returned inside. It's at this time that various stories emerge. As we know, when events unfold quickly, it can be hard to determine what the sequence was or remember details clearly. This is especially true when one witnesses something violent or traumatic. Junta and Costin crossed paths once again in an area near the snack bar. Whether Junta had returned to the rink to hurry his son out of the locker room or to finish the fight with Costin is debatable. Whether Costin left the locker room to get a drink at the snack bar or stalked the lobby should his adversary return is also debatable. But as soon as they were in each other's sights, fists began to fly again. Ryan Carr would say that Costin threw the first punch. But Virginia Brings, who witnessed the fight while at the rink picking up her grandson, said that Junta ambushed Costin. A 12-year-old named Rachel said she witnessed Junta tackle Costin, throwing him to the ground. Junta then leaned on top of Costin, pummeling his head with his fists. Costin continued to try and strike back. Witnesses gathered around, screaming at Junta to stop. 
other men came to try and pull him off Costin. As one man grabbed him from behind to pull him away, he said Junta smashed Costin's head into the floor twice. By this time, Costin had stopped moving. Virginia Brings would testify that as Junta was hitting Costin, she screamed at him, He's not responding! He's not responding! Stop! She said she saw Costin's leg jerk to the right side of his body. He then laid motionless. Junta quickly left the rink through the front door. He heard sirens approaching and stood in the parking lot waiting. He knew he'd have questions to answer from the cops about the fight. He didn't try to run away, but waited for the squad cars to arrive. Inside, Costin lay on the floor, still not moving. An ambulance was called, as well as Costin's mother, Joan. Costin's face was bloodied, his nose smashed, and his neck bruised and swollen. His children gathered around him, crying. One of his sons leaned over him, holding his hand and pleading, Please, Dad, get up! Joan Costin asked who had done this to her son. A witness pointed outside at Junta. She walked up to him and said, These children don't have a mother, so you'd better get on your knees and beg God nothing happens to their father. This episode is brought to you by Away. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash once and use offer code ONCE20 at checkout. Away Travel makes suitcases for how we travel today. Their carry-on bags come in two sizes with an optional ejectable battery that can charge your cell phone up to five times, so you'll never be out of commission no matter where you travel. It can also charge your tablets or anything else powered by a USB cord, and you can pop it out easily to comply with all airline policies. I love that it's lightweight, but also ultra-durable, made of German polycarbonate or aluminum alloy. But if anything does break, Away gives you a lifetime warranty. They'll fix it or replace it for you for life. Away also gives you a 100-day trial, so you can make sure you love your new suitcase. And my listeners can get $20 off a suitcase by visiting awaytravel.com slash once and use promo code ONCE20. That's ONCE20 at checkout. Free shipping in the lower 48 states, too. That's awaytravel.com slash once and enter ONCE20 at checkout. Everyone needs a little help sometimes. Maybe you feel stuck in achieving a goal you've set for yourself. Other times, we may just feel blah, unfulfilled, or confused in which direction we should go in our lives. BetterHelp Online Counseling provides a convenient, affordable way to help you live your best life. With BetterHelp, you can connect with a licensed professional counselor to help you get unstuck. You can schedule convenient phone, text, chat, or video sessions in a safe and private online environment. Anything you share with your counselor is completely confidential. If you're not happy with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. They provide over 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 U.S. states, so you're sure to find the right professional for you. And BetterHelp is available worldwide. Best of all, it's truly affordable, starting at only $40 per week. And as a listener of this podcast, you can get 10% off your first month by going to BetterHelp.com dot com slash once and use discount code once. You can start communicating with a BetterHelp counselor in under 24 hours. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help you assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash once. As Michael Costin lay battered and bleeding in a hospital bed, his mother Joan Costin prayed for him to recover. His children needed him. He was all they had. Michael Costin hadn't had an easy life. Violence was part of his genetic makeup, it seemed. Costin's father, Gus, married Joan in 1957. They had two sons, Dennis and Michael. Gus would say that both of his sons had problems with alcohol. In 1975, 17-year-old Dennis came home drunk and a violent confrontation occurred. Dennis and his father, Gus, argued and fought for some time. And at some point during the fight, Gus Costin grabbed a hunting knife. Dennis was stabbed once through the heart and died. Gus was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to a year in prison. The remainder of his two-and-a-half-year sentence was suspended, with the judge citing no prior criminal record. Gus ended up serving just six months in a work-release program. 
Joan divorced him, and Michael and his father had a strained relationship after his release. Michael, perhaps unsurprisingly, suffered from psychological problems and began drinking heavily. Between 1983 and 1995, he was in and out of prison on breaking and entering and drunk driving charges. He was also arrested for assaulting a police officer. He'd spent time in psychiatric hospitals. But in the years prior to his death, Michael Costin had turned his life around. He'd gotten sober and in even won custody of his four children. He attended Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and went to church every Sunday. Costin, his family and friends said, was a good guy and a devoted father. Just before he'd left for the ice rink that fateful day, he'd been folding laundry. He'd had plans to return home that night to cook dinner for his family. Now he lay in a coma after suffering a brain hemorrhage. The hemorrhage had been caused by a ruptured artery in his neck due to the pummeling he'd received by Thomas Junta. When the paramedics had arrived, they had performed CPR on him, but there was no response and they could find no pulse. A defibrillator was used to attempt to shock his heart into beating again, but even that produced no response. As Michael Costin fought for his life, Thomas Junta was being questioned by police. The first officer on the scene said Junta was standing in front of the arena with a torn shirt and a cut on his face. When asked if he'd been in the fight, Junta admitted that he had. The officer reported that Junta was polite and cooperative. As Costin was taken away by ambulance, Junta was put into a squad car and transferred to the police station for questioning. There he gave his version of events. He and Costin had both swung at each other after a verbal altercation, he said. That was the first fight. He'd gone outside afterwards to wait for his son and his friends, but had returned inside to hurry them up and get them away from Costin. According to Junta, as he walked back in through the door and was walking towards Costin, quote, he made like a roundabout move at me, like a circle move. And again, it was like a mutual lunge. But you know, I got the upper hand. But we're on the floor, and he's kicking me and trying to hit me, and I'm hitting him. I only recall throwing maybe two or three more punches, unquote. At that point, he said someone pulled him away from Costin. He observed Costin bleeding from his nose. He said that Costin then, quote, laid back down and shit, I just stood there. I hope the guy's fine, he added at the end of his recorded statement. He was charged with assault. But Michael Costin never emerged from his coma, and a day later he died. Two hundred mourners attended his funeral. His young daughter was so distraught over losing her dad that she tried to climb into his casket at his wake. Junta was now facing a manslaughter charge. He pled not guilty and was released on $5,000 bail to await trial. At his trial, Junta took the stand in his own defense. He said that as soon as he saw Costin after he re-entered the building, the man lunged at him. He'd used his weight to knock Costin to the ground. Costin, still wearing his ice skates, put his feet up to kick and knee him. Junta said he tried to stop Costin from hitting him by landing, quote, three quick blows, unquote. At that point, Costin stopped moving. Some witnesses backed up Junta's claim that Costin had swung first. Quinlan Junta took the stand to testify on his father's behalf. He said that he'd heard screaming while he was in the locker room, and when he emerged, saw Costin on his father's back. His father then flung the man over his shoulders and onto the ground. I saw them fall, he testified, and my dad went to his knees. My dad was holding him down so he couldn't hit him. Then Quinlan said he saw his father give three quick punches to Costin. Ryan Carr also testified that it had been Costin who'd started the second fight that had ended in his tragic death. He said he'd seen Costin raise his leg and draw his arm back as Junta walked towards him after entering the building, initiating the second fight. But other witnesses would testify that Junta had returned to the building and tackled Costin, knocking him to the floor. Junta had pinned him down with his knees and beat Costin in the head with his fists until the man stopped moving and he was pulled away, these witnesses reported. Virginia Brings said, It was something I'll never forget. He went on and on. It seemed like forever. I kept screaming, Stop! Stop! 
Think of your children. You're going to kill him. The number of punches that Junta had thrown while Costin was on the ground was described as three quick blows by the defense, while the prosecution would call witnesses who testified to more, with Costin receiving as many as ten blows to the head, some would say. The defense told the jury that Junta was sucker-punched by Costin and then returned just a couple of blows in self-defense. But the forensic pathologist who testified for the prosecution said that Michael Costin had suffered a vicious attack. The injuries he'd sustained came from substantial force injury, he said. The ligaments at the back of Costin's neck were torn, he said, which could have only happened by the use of great force and multiple blows. He explained that there were two areas where Costin had received severe injuries. The base of the neck where an artery had ruptured, cutting off 25% of the blood supply to the brain, and internal trauma to the left side of the head above the ear. The last injury, which was not related to the first, resulted in severe bleeding of the brain. But pathologist Ira Canfer, testifying for the defense, disagreed, stating that the torn artery the victim had suffered could have been caused by just one blow. The defense tried to bring in Costin's psychological history. They wanted to enter into evidence the fact that the victim had been admitted to a psychiatric hospital more than once and had a history of violent behavior. At the time of his death, he was taking several medications for anxiety and depression. His own father, Gus Costin, made statements about his son's anger problems. He'd even approached Junta during the trial to tell him that he forgave him. The judge, however, would not allow the jury to hear about the victim's psychological history. Junta's history of violence would also not be heard by the jury. Not until after the trial did information come out about his past run-ins with the law. In 1991, Junta's wife Michelle filed an affidavit stating that she'd suffered verbal and physical abuse by her husband and that her children had witnessed him hitting her. Junta had also been arrested for assault and battery after punching a police officer. Charges were never filed in either incident. Rather than being charged with assaulting an officer, Junta was only required to pay the officer $250 for tearing a gold chain from his neck. On January 11, 2002, the jury convicted Thomas Junta of involuntary manslaughter on the theory of unlawful killing by the commission of a battery. Later, it was discovered that most of the jury wanted to convict on voluntary manslaughter but couldn't come to a unanimous agreement. After 14 hours of deliberation, they decided to compromise and convict on the lesser charge. When Costin ended up on the bottom, that's when self-defense stopped, one juror said. He had the chance to stop throwing punches and say, someone call the police. No matter who was the initial aggressor in the fight, jurors believed that Junta was ultimately responsible for taking the fight to a lethal level. Before sentencing, Junta's family was allowed to ask for leniency. His sister Barbara said, I'm sorry Mr. Costin passed away. That was terrible. But I would want the judge to understand that my brother is a good man, a good father. The victim's family members were also allowed to make impact statements. His mother, Joan Costin, took the stand without a written statement and just spoke from the heart. I don't even have a paper because there's not words that I can tell you about the loss we feel. He was his children's ray of hope. They did not have an easy childhood, so he meant everything to them, and he tried to be everything to them. She had now lost both of her sons to violence, and her heartbreak was palpable. Michael Costin's children also gave statements. His son Brendan described for the judge how he'd held his father's bleeding head in his hands and said, quote, I realized I had just witnessed my dad literally getting beat to death, unquote. But the most powerful impact statement came from now 14-year-old Michael Costin Jr., who took the stand and pleaded with the judge. After the game ended, we got, we got off the ice. I saw Thomas Junta beating my dad into the ground. For the rest of that day and for the next day, my heart was in my throat. I never, not for a second, stopped thinking of what happened to my dad. Please punish Thomas Junta before I finish, Your Honor. I want you to know what punishment that I hope you give to Thomas Junta for what he did to my dad. First, no matter how much of a sentence that you give to Thomas Junta, 
My dad got more. My dad will never be back to me and to my family. Thomas Junta will be back to his family. If you give Thomas Junta an easy sentence, he may get out and do this again. Please teach Thomas Junta a lesson. Let the world know that a person can't do what Thomas Junta did to my dad. By the time of the sentencing hearing, the judge had information regarding Junta's past violent behavior and said that although he had not been convicted of domestic violence, it was a troubling indication and was not the first time Mr. Junta struck another adult in front of minor children. The judge sentenced Thomas Junta to serve six to ten years at the Massachusetts Correctional Institute at Cedar Junction. In 2003, Junta appealed his conviction on the grounds that the prosecution had withheld evidence that might have been used to discredit the testimony of the pathologist for the prosecution. The appeals court denied his motion for a new trial in 2004. He tried again, filing a petition with the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts in 2006 on the Brady violation. They also denied his petition. Junta filed for early release in 2008, but it was rejected by the parole board, who said he had not shown any remorse for Costin's death. On August 26, 2010, Thomas Junta was released from prison, having completed his sentence. He had served a total of eight years in prison. As we know, violent crime can create a ripple effect in the families of victims that can sometimes last for generations. The trauma of this terrible event and the death of Michael Costin caused reverberations in both the Costin and Junta families. All of Michael Costin's children struggled after the death of their father. Like the grandmother had told the judge, he was their ray of hope, their anchor, and when he was taken from them, they floundered. The oldest, Brendan, who'd held his father's broken body on the floor of the ice rink, was able to overcome many challenges and go on to become a college graduate. His other two brothers were not as resilient. Sean was charged with domestic violence after abusing a girlfriend, and continued legal issues caused him to lose custody of his children for a time. Michael Jr., who'd pleaded for his father's killer to be given a long sentence, was the most troubled throughout his life. According to the Gluster Times, quote, after the case was over and the attention faded away, Michael Costin Jr.'s life spiraled into drugs and alcohol abuse and violence, court records show, unquote. He was arrested at age 20, and after pleading guilty to assaulting his girlfriend and stealing her car, was sentenced to 18 months in jail. It was the second time he was to serve time for beating up the same girlfriend. He'd already been brought before the court numerous times on other violations and had been shown leniency. The court prosecutors knew of his family history and tried to provide him substance abuse and mental health resources in lieu of jail time. But Costin didn't take advantage of these opportunities, and finally found himself serving a lengthy sentence beginning in 2009. In 2013, he was arrested again for assault and battery domestic violence. Even more tragic is the fate of Quinlan Junta. In February 2011, just months after his father was released from prison, 21-year-old Quinn turned himself in when a warrant was issued for his arrest, charging him with home invasion, armed robbery, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and conspiracy to commit a crime. Reading police said that he and a 20-year-old man, Jason Mall, participated in a home invasion robbery at the Reading Commons housing development. During the commission of the robbery, a 19-year-old man was pistol-whipped and robbed of $800 cash. Junta and the victim were acquainted with one another, and the victim identified him and Mall. Mall was arrested immediately after the robbery, and Junta turned himself in soon after. The break-in was reportedly drug-related. Eight months later, while being held in custody at the Leahy Clinic in Burlington, Quinn Junta died of unreported causes. His family and friends wrote messages about him on social media, describing him as a great kid who had been friendly to everyone in his youth and who loved hockey. He had struggled with drug and alcohol addiction after the painful events of his past, and his life began to unravel. It was a sad end for a very promising young man, his coaches and friends would say.
Thomas Junta continued to claim self-defense in the death of Michael Costin. But the world would come to identify Junta as the hockey dad who lost his cool and took things too far. Sideline rage would be blamed for a growing number of incidents of parents behaving badly at their children's sports games. In July of 2000, at a girls' softball game in Georgia, dozens of parents rushed the field after a player was tagged too roughly. Two mothers, both coaches, each spent 10 days in jail for the incident. A youth hockey coach was attacked by the father of one of the players on the team. He suffered a concussion and a broken tooth. His attacker was sentenced to two years probation. Also in 2000, a father in New York was arrested for breaking the nose of his son's coach with a hockey stick. Attacks on referees became such a common threat that the National Association of Sports Officials began offering assault insurance for its members. States began to respond to the increased violent crimes committed against officials by passing tougher laws. What causes parents to act out this way at something so trivial as the score of a little kicker soccer game or a bad call in a peewee baseball tournament? Some would say it's a case of parents living vicariously through their children. If they didn't feel like they were sufficiently skilled at sports when they were young, or, the flip side of the coin, they're trying to relive their own glory days in team sports, they may put too much value on their children's accomplishments. Or it might be that certain parents are just ultra-competitive and become incensed if their child's team starts to lose and begin railing about bad calls made by the refs. Finally, some parents are overly protective and worry about their child getting hurt, either physically or emotionally, and go into mama bear or papa bear mode, ready and willing to fight anyone they feel is a threat to their child. This is what motivated Thomas Junta into reacting when he saw his child being bullied on the ice. But he didn't use restraint when he became frustrated. Instead of taking the matter up with the rink manager, removing his son from the game and walking away from a bad situation, or any other number of options, he decided to settle the matter with his fists. After his first encounter with Michael Costin, when his concerns were brushed off, he was, by his own admission, quote, shaking with anger, unquote. The fact that he was willing to get into a fistfight with another adult in front of his young son was the first indication that he was out of control. That, added to his size and strength, and the fact that Michael Costin was also willing to engage in a physical confrontation, created the perfect formula for this tragic event. Thomas Junta may not have intended to kill Michael Costin on that July day, but he allowed his anger to get the better of him. His uncontrolled rage led to the death of one man and the long-lasting harmful and even deadly effects on two families. That will do it for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'll be back next week with another chapter of Bad Sports. And you know, I have to cover a doping incident, or what is sometimes more colorfully called roid rage. It's a shocker. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. We have a new website up. Much thanks to Lorena Garcia for taking on this project. You can now go to truecrimepodcast.com and find links and listen to the latest episodes of Once Upon a Crime, Let's Talk About True Crime, and the next chapter. You can also find info on all our great sponsors along with discount codes. Information about CrimeCon is also there, as well as the links to our social media pages. Finally, we now have merch. Go to truecrimepodcast.com to get t-shirts, mugs, and more with the OUAC logo. We're rolling out more new merchandise and new designs throughout the spring and summer. I want to thank you all for your continuing support of Once Upon a Crime. As the number of true crime podcasts grows, your help in sharing the show with your friends, family, and coworkers is so important to help others find it. As I'm still independently producing this podcast, Word of mouth is one of the only ways to help grow the show and reach new listeners. I am grateful to all of you for subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast, and especially referring it to others. So from time to time, I want to pay that forward by sharing with my listeners another independent podcast that I think more people should know about. This time, I want to tell you about a podcast from the UK. One Eye Open is a true crime podcast that is independently produced by Steffi in the UK. I'll share a little bit of Steffi with you at the end of the show. If you like what you hear, please go and subscribe to One Eye Open on your favorite podcast app. I've included a link in the show notes. Thanks. 
Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Until next time, be good to one another. Hello, I'm Steffi, the host of One Eye Open, my very own true crime podcast. I write, research, and produce each episode from my fancy little room here in England. Join me as I delve deeply into mysterious murders and painful punishments. The terrible tales are real, and although dark, I'm sure they'll appeal. I've been described as the Mary Poppins of true crime, but you'll need more than a spoonful of sugar to help these crimes go down. I'd recommend a gin and tonic, a large one. If you like your true crime served with ice, lemon, and a touch of class, then come and find me, Steffi, on my podcast One Eye Open. I'll be waiting for you.